This excerpt was taken from a Full and Bloom interview with bassist Greg Chason. You can listen to the entire interview at fullandbloom.com. With the audition process, I know you meet Jake during the Ozzy auditions, but he actually calls you to come audition? Yeah, him and I stayed in contact while um, he was in Ozzy, and he would call me from the road, and we'd have some time off in town. He'd come over, and my wife would cook dinner and uh, just kind of hang out. We kind of... We had a friendship going. And so when he left Ozzy, he'd always told me when I leave, leave Ozzy, we'll do something. So I assumed when he left Ozzy, I was just going to be in whatever his band was going to be called. Well, then he wanted me to audition for it. And I was kind of caught off guard. And I thought, man, if I audition and I don't get the gig, I'm going to look like an idiot because all my friends know that I know Jake and that, you know, I had said, yeah, someday Jake and I are going to be in his band. So I just didn't want to audition. So what I told him is audition everyone that you can. And if you don't find anyone, I'll come in and audition. And so we went through that process two or three times. And then finally, at the end of it, you know, I ended up getting the gig. Now, I kind of figured out the reason that he did that is because he didn't, everyone knew we were friends and he didn't want me to get the gig just because we didn't want people saying I only got the gig because he and I were friends. And people said that anyway. But he wanted to be where I went in and proved that I was the guy for the for the job, whatever. So in the end, it worked out great, and I'm glad that I auditioned, and the experience was really interesting, and uh, um, I, I wouldn't change it, that's for sure. Does he already kind of have a deal set in place, or, nope. or what's that? No, he did not. Okay, so you guys formed the band, and I can't even remember. I was thinking um, the last Ozzy record he did it was um, like 86 or oh. something, and then he toured, and so there was like a year or two break in there. Is that correct? I I think that probably when he was out of Ozzy by maybe the spring of 87 or early summer, and then he didn't do anything till sometime in 88. So I, I, I want to say that he took almost a year off. I could be wrong. Um, what happened was he just took some time and he, you know, he had some money and he had his, had his daughter, Jade. So he was kind of just doing that. And uh, anyone knows Jake, he doesn't make any snap decisions. I think he just sat there and pondered on what he wanted to do. And, and he, I was around him quite a bit then. And so, you know, I would come over and we'd go to lunch or I'd come over and play me a riff that he was working on, you know, for this, unnamed uh, mystery project that he was going to do. And I wasn't saying, hey, am I going to be in your band? I was just kind of playing it cool, waiting to see what was going to happen. And then um, he decided to, uh, well, Ray Gillen called him, and Jake didn't return his call. So Ray Gillen's mother called Jake and said, hey, you need to uh, have my son come out there. He's a great singer, and he really wants to play with you, and you need to make this happen. And <laughs> so Jake, you know, who was just kind of, going at his own speed, said, well, if I got someone's mom pissed off at me, I guess I better bring him out. <laughs> so he brought Ray and then Eric, and the three of them played together without a bass player. And Jake really liked it. And uh, Jake and I uh, were going out to see BC Rich for, uh, they want, they were, I was already with BC Rich, but they were trying to move Jake over. So they sent a limo to Jake's house and they drove us the 60 miles out to the middle of the high desert where BC Rich was at. And in, in the car on the way there, he played me the rehearsal tape that he'd made with Eric and uh, Ray. And he uh, he said, you want to hear this singer? And I said, yeah, sure. And obviously it was great because it was Ray and Ray was just making up lyrics on the spot on just riffs that Jake was making up. But in the interim of listening to that, I said, you know, Ray's really great, but you ought to, you should think about keeping this drummer. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm thinking of, you know, I like him too. And that was Eric. So that's when, you know, he had those two guys already in tow. And that's when he said, do you want to audition? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> Weird on my part. I mean, he auditioned like 40 different guys, and a lot of them were guys that were in bands and named guys. But I think, you know, Jake and I had been together in Scotland, and Jake's way of playing, he just comes in and starts jamming on a riff. And he doesn't come in with a song, it's just a jam, and then you just jam around for 45 minutes on the same kind of riff where you're changing tempos and changing keys and changing directions. And Jake's very well versed. He can go from metal to blues to country to ragtime to folk, to jazz, and everything in between, river dance, all at the same time. And you got to have enough on the ball to be able to kind of figure out what he's doing and to make it interesting. He doesn't seem arrogant or, or rock star-ish or anything. He seems like a pretty... There's uh, no pre no pretense to what he does. He is who he is. Um, you know, has he been a rock star and a guitar hero? Yeah. Has it changed him? No. 
He's exactly the same way he was. Success or not success, whatever. Jake's just like a regular guy. You know, Ray, for the most part, it never affected him either. So, you know, I, I don't think we made enough money to really act like big rock stars. You know what I mean? Sure. What was uh, Ray like to work with? Ray was uh, incredible. He, Ray was the only singer I've ever played with. That no matter how many takes you took in the studio or sound checks, rehearsals, even if he didn't have words, he sang every single one. Even if he was just making it up. Ray sang every take we ever did in the studio, every sound check. Ray never missed anything because that's where he had his fun. Ray liked to go out and sing. So, yeah, he, and, and being around Ray, you would be convinced that he was his best friend. Ray was that guy. And so do you guys gig at all beforehand, before getting the record contract, or is it just put the band together and then you get signed? We put the band together, and then we went in and did demos. Uh, we looked for management. We talked to a bunch of different managers, and we were actually going to go with Larry Mazur, who at the time managed Cinderella and Kiss. And at the last minute, uh, we ended up going with Paul O'Neill, and uh, who none of us liked. But he made a bunch of promises. Some of them he uh, followed through on them. Some of them he did. But uh, he was part of Lieber and Krebs or had been part of Lieber Krebs. So he promised all these different things. Like I said, some of it came to fruition. But none of us ever really cared for him. There was just something about him that, you know, even Ray, who had known him from Lieber and Krebs, he was just kind of a, I hate to speak ill of the dead because he's gone and may right. he rest in peace. It was just, uh, there was something about him that made you go, something's not right here. And it ended up, you know, in the end, when we parted company with him, it's because things were not right. When I saw the that he produced you and managed, I thought, that's kind of weird, because I was thinking his only connection at the time, was he doing anything besides the sabotage stuff at that time? I think sabotage was the one thing he was doing. You got to remember, on that first Badlands record, the only stuff he produced is the stuff that doesn't sound right. So Jake basically produced that record. What happened is when we went in to mix it, Paul O'Neill behind our back added some triggers to the drums, and we didn't know about it till it was actually mastered, and there was nothing we could do about it. So the snare drums triggered and all that, and none of us, including Eric, wanted that. And um, he buried the, you know, because he changed the drum sound, he buried the bass and some of the stuff. So Jake wasn't really happy with that. So when the next record was going to come out, we already knew that Jake was going to do it by himself and it would be all Jake's sonic ideas as opposed to having Paul O'Neill because he was a record company. Part of the deal that we made with him is he would get to produce our first record. Well, he didn't know anything. So you know, having him produce it, you know, that's like me saying, look, I'll be, I'll, I'll be in the, uh, I'll be in NASA but I want to be able to fly the space shuttle. Like the first time it goes up, I want to fly it. Think about flying the space shuttle. Tony right. didn't know anything about production. <laughs> right. right. And, and Sabotage is funny. I mean, they just put out, I was always stunned how they kept their contract with Atlantic. I mean, I, I didn't know they were even selling records until like Hall of the Mountain King, you know, but that was a long ride that they took. And then of course he went on to do the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and, and uh, yeah. huge success with that. But, but yeah, I just thought that was a strange connection that, you know, you're on a major label. Why don't you get some, uh, like a big ass producer? One of the reasons why is because a big ass producer costs big ass money. And uh, Paul, uh, you know, he was a necessary evil. Um, we figured that he would get a production credit, but we would basically, we thought that we would be able to override whatever he was doing. And what he did in the end, like I said, there was a time during the mixing process where he kind of changed some stuff to the way he wanted it, which was not the way we wanted it. And by the time it came out, by the time we realized what was going on, the record had already been mastered. We just figured, well, we'll deal with this now. And, you know, I'll... I'll talk to people all the time that say that that's their favorite record of the three and they like the sound of that one better. But I'll also talk to a lot of people that say they like the sound of Voodoo Highway better. Um, the Voodoo Highway record is much more organic. Yeah. And the uh, the first one's kind of slick and it's, dare I say, mildly overproduced. Yeah. I, yeah, you know? yeah, mildly is, I, I think, the word, definitely. Because I, I definitely don't think it was overly produced. Be, uh, compared to uh, a lot of that stuff from the 80s. <laughs> but uh, it's you know, still we, kind of organic sounding, you know, I, I thought. Uh, I mean, it is for what other people were doing, but it wasn't raw enough for us. We wanted something raw, more earthy, you know, for lack of a better word. And, and part of it is because he mixed the bass out of it, you lose that kind of uh, girth. Dreams in the dark, and you hear the bass, the melody line, and you hear it on some of High Wire and Rumble and Train. But there's other stuff where it's kind of not where if you listen to where bass is at on the second record versus the first one, you can hear the difference. So I think that's 
I know that Jake was missing. Obviously, I was. And I think that the drum sound, uh, again, the drums. And when I listen to that and I hear Eric Snare drum, it's like, that's not what we had in mind. But and the other thing is, when we recorded that record, there's up to 30 takes of some of those songs. Voodoo Highway, there's not one song on there that has more than four takes. And Dusk is all one take. And so why did you do 30 takes of the others? It's what Paul and you wanted. Oh, okay. So he was sitting and, yeah. in there the whole time. Oh, no, he was. And you know, once the basic tracks were done, we, um, we didn't think it was going to sound the way it sounded, regardless of whether he was there or not. We, we thought it was going to sound more raw sounding. Again, it's not a bad sounding record. I'm not saying I don't like it. It's a great record. I like all the songs on it. The performances are outstanding. I'm not putting down the record in any way, shape, or form. I just think that we could have done a better record without Paul O'Neill. If you ever get to talk to Jake, I'm sure he'll concur with me 100%. Do you recall what the budget was for that record? I want to say around 400000 God almighty. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, I, think we spent, I think we spent every bit of it. Wow. That's incredible. And and so they're just basing that, I'm, I'm sure, uh, just from Jakey e. Lee, right? Just uh, to get that kind of... Much. Yeah, man. Do you keep in touch with Eric? No, nope. oh, not okay. at all. That's on his anatomy for something that I didn't do, but Eric's kind of a stubborn guy, so he's decided that he's still going to be mad at me, and I can't control that. I'd like nothing more than to be friends with him, but if he wants to be mad at me, then have at it. Why is he mad at you? It would take too long to go into. It's over something that was said in print that was credited to me that I didn't say, and when I tried to explain to Eric that I didn't say that, he just wasn't going to hear it. Um, I know that uh, we have some mutual friends. He doesn't hold me in high esteem, so whatever. And this is, I'm assuming this is, it sounds like it's after he left the band. Well, we became friends after he left. We didn't get along at all while we were in the band together until the very end. Really? And then after, we didn't like each other at all. I used to flip a coin every week. I'd beat the hell out of Eric and get kicked out of the band or put up with Eric's crap. I, I would annoy him. He would annoy me. And it's not his fault or my fault. We just didn't jive. We just did not get along. He didn't get what I was doing. I didn't care what he was doing. And through that, we managed to make a really great record. And, you know, um, our road manager at the time would come up to me and say, you know, people come to see Badlands to see Jake and Ray. And they go away from Badlands thinking how great Jake and Ray is, but also how great the rhythm section is. He goes, that's a high compliment. So even if we didn't get along, um, we played together great. And we eventually were friends, and we got along great. We did my solo record, and he played great on it. I think he's a great drummer. He's actually a really good singer, too. And like I said, he's mad at me, and I can't control <laughs> It's like this, Adam. You want to be mad at me, I can't stop you. I, and if Eric wants to be mad at me, I can't stop him. I wish we were friends, but we're not, so whatever. Sure. So I wish him, I wish him the best. He's a big rock star and a millionaire, and I'm a guy that runs a guitar store and, you know, has a good time being a musician. I'm sure he's happy. I'm happy. And I wish him nothing but the best. Eric came up to me. I'd be more than happy to talk to him, but I'm not going to spend one second worrying about it. Uh, Great drummer, though. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought that for a second. It, both of you guys seem like you're uh, super laid back cats. So, And then especially a drummer and a bass player, man, who are supposed to lock in with each other. It seems uh, that must have been hell if it would have uh, been a pain in the ass. <laughs> Nah, I like the fact that you said laid back cats, you know, then Eric is the cat, you know, and Kiss, so I, that wasn't lost on me. The way that we did that record is Eric just played Jake. He didn't spend any time paying attention to me. That's the way he does it anyway. He's more focused on the guitar player. And what I did is I just tailor-made my bass parts to go with what he what he was playing. It wasn't like we sat down and wrote anything out. It's just him playing with Jake and then me figuring out what he was doing and then me playing to it. Two. 